Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Hello. This is the last webinar in the HIG FPM um, series, Step by Step, the HIG FPM Verification Trail. And now we have come to the longest section in the HIG FPM, the Chemicals Management section. This may be the most demanding section, but it is actually also a really interesting and uh, exciting. Um, exciting section and I actually already saw that someone has already posted the first question so uh, let's begin. Um, my name is Karen Eckberg, I am the uh, CEO of Leadership and Sustainability. I have a long experience in the sustainability area. I have also worked at brands um, uh, to uh, manage environment and sustainability and now since five years, more than five years already, um, uh, managing the company leadership and sustainability. And go to webinar features, you are all on mute. You can send questions throughout this webinar. You just open the question uh, box and then you can type your question and send it off. And just a note as well, this is uh, copyrighted material. And to our agenda, we will focus on the chemicals management section, uh, including we will have a demo and uh, we will also have time for questions and a discussion. And finally, we will also show you some of our services and invite you to connect with us um, about verification, for example, or further trainings. So that is the agenda. And here you see the overview of the verification trail and all the different sections. And finally, we have come to the chemicals management section. So let's go there. First of all, before you can begin responding to the actual scored questions, you will receive your applicability questions as you do in all the other sections as well. And uh, you will be asked which processes you have in your factory. And for example, dyeing and tanning, um, finishing, screen printing, metal finishing, primers, cements and adhesives, cleaning solvents. And um, those are all um, uh, this, apart from cleaning solvents, those are all chemicals that are used in your processes. You may also use chemicals for other purposes, but here are the main um, um, groups that we are using in the factory, in the manufacturing processes. So it is important that you really um, that you ensure the correct applicabilities here, that you uh, give information about which processes you have in your factory. So if you have printing, dyeing, laundry or washing, leather tanning, fiber extrusion. And um, that is, uh, this is um, an important step because um, if you uh, co um, respond correctly here, you will also uh, get the corresponding questions. For example, if you're not using chemicals in your manufacturing processes, then the number of questions that you will respond to will be lower. So you will not receive all questions. And therefore, again, as in all the other sections, of course, as well, the applicabilities are really important. And now here, let me show you an overview of all the questions. So uh, this is the questions at level one. And we already at level one, we have 13 questions. And um, you remember you will need to uh, respond with a yes or partial yes to all questions at level one in order to be allowed to move on to levels two and three. So this section is very different from the water section, for example, where you only have to know your water consumption in order to be able to move on to levels two and three. Here you really have to do a lot of groundwork in order to be able to move on. But as you will see, uh, all those questions, they build on each other step by step and they help reinforce each other as well. So basically, if you um, go through all the questions in the chemical section, you will see that you will be able to build a really good chemicals management system. So we begin with the chemical inventory Exactly a similar question like your water consumption, for example, you need to know what you have. And then uh, over SDS, safety data sheets, safety equipment, over to RSL compliance, MRSL compliance. And the last question, number 13, is about traceability. 
which is also uh, one a really important question and one question that may be a bit challenging um, for some facilities. And then at level two, we have three questions, improvement plan, hazardous chemical reductions and preferred chemical sourcing. And then finally at level three, we have seven questions. So um, in total, we have actually 23 questions. So this is in that sense, the largest section, uh, the section with the most number of questions um, in the HIG FEM. And we begin uh, with uh, developing our chemical inventory. So uh, all chemicals used in the manufacturing processes should be listed. All chemicals used in tooling and equipment and all chemicals used to operate and maintain the facility. And um, there is a template made available by SETI at C, and you can find it when you click on this link. So it's a really a good template to use. And um, this is the foundation of your chemicals management. So if you don't know which chemicals you are using, or uh, their, for example, their um, hazard um, category or their CAS number or what the content is in this formulation, then you will not be able to build a good chemical management system. So spend the time necessary to build your inventory here. And the inventory, it is the starting point for all good chemicals management systems. It should include all chemicals used in the factory, not only the chemicals used for production. And you need to know which chemicals you are using. And you need to also collect a lot of documentation into the inventory sheet that you are using. So for example, um, chemical name and type, supplier vendor name and type, the presence of safety data sheets, the function, hazard classification, where used, storage conditions and location, the quantities, the cast number or numbers, if you have a mixture, the lot numbers, really, really important also when it comes to the traceability topic, MRSL compliance, purchase date, expiration dates, if applicable. And then also uh, the question is also if you have, if you don't have all this information, is there an action plan to obtain this data? And here also, um, we sometimes receive this question, if you have to have everything in one single table, all this information, and no, you don't need to have that. So the how to HIG, the HIG guidance says that you need to have it available. So you should be able to show where you have your safety data sheets, for example, um, or the uh, the storage conditions, etc. If you don't have that in one in one single table, uh, but it is not necessary to have only one single large table with everything in there. And um, and then the suggested upload is the chemical inventory. And uh, please upload this uh, document. Um, it will help you also during verification. And as usual, it is really good if you upload as many documents as possible, especially if you are going to get um, verified uh, because then the verifier can prepare also accordingly. But even so, if you are only going to do a self-assessment um, and are not moving forward to the verification, please upload as many documents as, you, as possible because that makes um, the entire um, collection and the entire self-assessment much more complete. And you will also be able to always remember why you responded uh, yes to a certain question. So the chemical inventory and then um, also the action plan for obtaining data that is not included in your inventory is what should be uh, uploaded here. So this is question number one, and here you are laying the foundation for your chemicals management. Then the next question is about SDS available to employees. Does your facility make safety data sheets SDS available to employees for all chemicals used? And we suggest here that you upload photo images showing that the SDS or MSDS are available and um, 
hopefully they are also compliant with the GHS system. Um, and uh, I know that it may not be possible in all countries or from all chemical suppliers to uh, to get those, but at least you should have the corresponding information available and also the labeling that you need to have. And in the portal, you certainly don't need to upload all your safety data sheet. That may be a lot of work to do. Um, so uh, a few examples, for example, and um, uh, also photo images showing that they are made available. Because what is important here is, of course, that employees who are handling or using or storing the chemicals, that they always have access to the safety data sheet or a good summary of the safety data sheet. We sometimes see that as well, a really, a really good summary with the highlights of the information that they need to know like, for example, the hazard classification, safety measures, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment uh, guidance. And of course, the safety data sheet should, or should always be available in the local language, in the language that the workers speak. So, and then question number three is about your employees and your workers. So does your facility train all employees who use chemicals on, on chemical hazards, risks, proper handling, and what to do in case of an emergency or spill? And here we suggest that you upload a sample training, the content covered during the training, number of employees trained, and frequency of the training conducted. And you remember from the previous webinars, whenever there is something new in the HIG FEM 2020, we have marked it up as a green box, as you can see here. And uh, then the question number um, four is about the emergency response plan. And the question is, does your facility have a chemical spill and emergency response plan that is practiced periodically? The suggested upload is the training topic, content covered during the training, the number of employees trained, frequency of training conducted, and the emergency response plan and the procedure as well. Question number five, does your facility have appropriate and operable protective and safety equipment as recommended by the GHS safety data sheet in all areas where chemicals are stored and used? So we suggest here that you upload the schedule for internal checks, audits for chemical safety, the inventory list of PPEs and safety equipment that you have available with schedules of stock replenishment, equipment maintenance or replacement, wherever applicable. And this is, of course, um, a very, very important part that you know exactly um, wherever you are uh, storing or handling or using chemicals that you have decided which PPE measures and which safety equipment you need to have available or that the workers need to use. And of course, you should have also the corresponding signage so that it is clear um, which um, PPE the worker should be using. And of course, uh, if you have visitors, uh, then those visitors should also follow the corresponding instructions. Okay, and then the chemical hazard signage. Does your facility have chemical hazard signage and safe handling equipment in the areas of the facility where chemicals are used? And signages, they must be clearly visible and understood by relevant employees and workers. So it should be part of the training to uh, show them uh, how to read the signs and how to understand the signs. And um, yes, and also, of course, in the chemical uh, storage and operations area, you need to have them as well. And the handling equipment should be available at relevant, at all relevant um, locations. So this was uh, basically the first half already of the level one question that we are still at a quite a basic level but such an important level as well and um, I can really encourage you to build a good plan here and work in a very systematic manner so I think that you have learned that now when you have been working all the other sections and in the EMS section 
how to work in a systematic and structured manner. And this is true for this case as well. So take um, uh, a map of your location, of your buildings, mark up where you have your chemical storages, where chemicals are handled, handled and used in the processes. And correspondingly, depending on which chemicals we are talking about here, de decide uh, what the signage need to be, what the security measures should be, um, the uh, operating, the handling equipment that you need, the PPE that you need, and, and do this for the entire factory. And then you have a really good plan. Then it's very easy to uh, correspondingly attach the, uh, the signage and the labels and make sure that the PPE is available um, in every location where it is needed. Because this helps you to have the same approach everywhere and for example, not in one of your chemical storage um, areas to have certain um, requirements and in another one where you are storing similar chemicals to have other uh, requirements. So that plan is, uh, is really a good thing to do. And of course, wherever you build such plans, those are things you can live on for, long, for a long time. Of course, they need to be reviewed regularly, but this is something you can use then year by year as well. Okay, and now let's move on to the questions related to MRSL and RSL. And this question um, uh, is about purchasing procedures for MRSL and RSL. But what I first want to do is I just want to go through the difference between the RSL and the MRSL. So the RSL, that's the restricted substances list, and it... Um, uh, depicts which chemicals are restricted in the end product, so what goes out of the factory. And you can see in this very simplified uh, picture here, you see the end product, t-shirt and shoes, and the restricted substances list is um, requiring to make sure that the final products do not contain the chemicals listed in the RSL above certain limits. And the RSLs have been around for 20 years already. This is not a new phenomenon. And the MRSLs, the Manufacturing Restricted Substances List, they control which chemicals are restricted in the manufacturing processes. So basically what goes into the factory. And you can see that as well here in the picture. Here we have a chemical entering the factory and here we restrict the use of certain chemicals with the help of the MRSL, the Manufacturing Restricted Substances List. And now you would say, okay, but um, what goes in goes out as well. Yes, in many cases this is true, but when it comes to chemicals in your factory, this is not true. So whenever you are using chemicals in your processes, there will be reactions taking place and um, the chemicals may also, of course, as you can see in the picture here, they may uh, leave the factory in the wastewater, in the air emissions, or even in waste as well. Uh, and um, of course, due to the reactions that take place, you may have other chemicals going out with the products than what you were um, entering into the factory. So the MRSL is here, of course, to help make sure that the error RSL can be met, but it is also there in order to safeguard workers' health and to safeguard the environment. So this is the connection between MRSL and RSL and, of course, also the difference. The MRSL is a bit newer as a phenomenon, but it is also by now actually a 10-year-old um, uh, approach that we are working with. All right, so now the question number seven is, does your facility select and purchase chemicals based on their hazards and MRSL, RSL requirements? And um, very often when it comes to RSL, there are some uh, sector um, uh, sector-wide RSL in operation, but also many of the brands and retailers that may be buying from you are using their individual RSLs. 
So you need to make sure that you have their RSS and that you know the testing procedures. If you are a, a, a final assembly factory, for example, it may be that the RSLs are tested on the materials or fabrics that come into your factory so that that testing has already been done. And in that case, of course, you need to ensure that that testing has actually been done according to the RSL. And then um, the MRSL, some brands and retailers, they have their own MRSL as well. But um, a lot of brands have actually aligned behind the CETHC manufacturing restricted substances list. So the CETHC is the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals Program. It's an initiative that is now also nearly 10 years old. And they have developed um, uh, where, and many brands are, um, are engaged there. And together they have developed this manufacturing restricted substances list. So it's quite a common uh, list. And you can see you, we, have the, we have the link here available for you to download that document. But you do need to make sure with every single buyer, brand or retailer or agent that is buying from you that you know exactly which RSL and which MRSL that are used uh, by them. And then you have to manage that. And in some cases, um, if you are uh, producing for many brands and retailers, you may have a lot of different lists that you need to manage. And you really need to do that uh, consistently and comprehensively as well. And this is actually sometimes a, um, a weak point that we see that um, you may have an MRSL or an RSL, but you are not clear about really how to use them and how to connect them to your inventory. And in your chemical inventory, for example, you should actually also always have um, a column or in addition in another document if needed, um, and information about the MRSL compliance. And so, and this is of course something you need to manage when you purchase your chemicals. So that is why we have this question here. Does your facility select and purchase chemicals based on their hazards and MRSL RSL requirements? So you need to have a purchase procedure and your purchasing department needs to be aligned with this and needs to um, need to implement this in all their communication with uh, your chemical suppliers as well. And here is also um, uh, one thing that we may see in some factories where you may have different departments who all buy chemicals and you actually need to make sure that anyone who is buying chemicals in your factory is aware of, this, um, of those procedures as well and um, is following them. Okay, and then uh, if yes, do all chemicals purchased and used in production meet the facility's chemical purchasing policy? And if no, do you have a process or plan for eliminating chemicals that do not meet the facility's chemical purchasing policy? So either you are already uh, following it or you otherwise you should have a process or plan in place. Okay. And um, then also your purchasing procedure, it should cover your CAS number uh, control, the MRSL, RSL declaration. So you should ask every single supplier to declare that they conform with your requirements. You should also have test reports um, where possible certificates, positive lists, if that is applicable, and uh, then you also have the possibility to use the uh, CETHC gateway um, and check the CETHC MRSL conformance levels and, um, and even also add your own um, chemicals in there to do that, uh, that control. So the purchasing procedure is a really important, uh, is really an important uh, procedure to, to manage well here. Okay, and the next question is about health and safety. Does your facility have an environmental and occupational health and safety program specific to chemicals management? So a facility 
uh, must identify health and safety roles and responsibilities and the appropriate control mechanisms to ensure health and safety, as well as a mechanism to reduce the potential for health and safety impacts. Knowledge of the hazards and exposure routes from the SDS is the starting point for an EHS program. And what we are asking for here is a letter of appointment, job descriptions, organization chart of the EHS responsible team experience um, and training records uh, as well. And so this program, this is not only about hiring the right people, it's really about having a comprehensive program related to health and safety uh, and specific in this case to chemicals management. So this may be a bit of a larger task, but many of the elements that we have been talking about so far may also uh, be um, folded in into your health and safety program. Okay, and then the upload that we suggest is uh, your EHS uh, procedures related to chemical storage. So this list continues. You saw here we began here with A to D with the upload and then here uh, the EHS procedures, um, the permits um, that you have, incident and accident and spill records. And, um, and so this is, um, as I said, quite a comprehensive program that we need to have in place. And now um, I also want to show you um, how we see it when it comes to the hierarchy of uh, chemicals management uh, and how to safeguard workers from hazardous chemicals. And you can see here, this is the hierarchy beginning with the best solution you can have replaced with lower toxicity chemicals. And perhaps there is even one level above that, and that would be avoid using chemicals. If there is any process where you can avoid using chemicals, that is of course the very best solution you would have. Uh, but then the next alternative would be to replace with lower toxicity chemicals. You can also change your processes to reduce the exposure potential. So if you are using uh, harmful chemicals um, that you cannot substitute for the moment, then perhaps there are process changes that you can make in order to reduce the exposure potential. Then we also have isolation of chemicals in the storage or in the process or when handling. We have ventilation and engineering controls. We have PPE, personal protective equipment, and uh, we have incident response. But you can see here as well that PPE is very far down. So um, imagine uh, how you work with chemicals in your factory. The use of PPE should not be the first solution. You should consider all the other alternatives before you actually um, uh, implement PPE measures. And of course, the last one, the incident response, this is uh, how you need to respond in, in case of an emergency. And hopefully you don't need to have this, uh, but in any case, you need to be prepared, of course, um, uh, for any emergency case. So this is about health and safety. And please remember this hierarchy here. It's actually a really nice um, help for you to understand how you can uh, safeguard your workers' health. Okay, and then we come to storage. And uh, you remember from yesterday about the waste storage. The requirements for the chemical storage are quite similar as the ones for um, hazardous waste. And so the question, first of all, is does your facility have well-marked designated chemical storage and temporary storage areas? And then we would suggest and expect that your chemical storage area is ventilated and that it is protected from unauthorized employees, that it has an easy entry and exit in emergencies, and that the storage containers um, are in good condition, closed and clearly labeled with their content. One discussion point we have quite often is storage areas protected from unauthorized employees. So it actually needs to be locked away. You need to have a lock there. And this is a really strict uh, requirement also from SAC and from Sumera. Um, there is no um, uh, freedom to choose differently here. You really need to make sure that all chemicals are locked away. 
and uh, safely protected from unauthorized employees. And then we have some examples here, a uh, tank that is stored outside, oil lubricant storage, secondary containment. Uh, you can see this is, of course, a very uh, good example where you have the secondary containment, this yellow box here, and which can take uh, then perhaps even the entire volume, but at least a, a large portion of the volume. Oh, at, of course, it should be able to take the entire volume. And um, and then when we move on then to question number 10, and now we come back again to the MRSL and RSL, and we're asking, does your facility train employees responsible for the chemical management system on restricted substances list and manufactured restricted substances list? And you need to describe the RSL and MRSL trainings conducted in the last calendar year. You should also select all topics included in your training, the MRSL, RSL, how many employees were trained and how frequently do you train your employees. So sorry for that, I had to take a sip of my tea here. Okay, so then um, the next question is about RSL compliance monitoring. And the question is, does your facility have a documented process to systematically identify, monitor and verify compliance with all product RSLs? and segregate chemical formulation materials and products which are non-compliant with RSL. And uh, here is also a new unscored question. Does your facility have a failure resolution process that is followed in the event of an RSL test failure? So, and perhaps you have already had this for a long time. It, it may um, be a part of uh, your brands and retailers who are buying from you that they have helped you set up this process um, but of course it is a really important part um, of your work and you need also then to upload a written documentation specifying your review process and here specifically and this has been changed this year this can also be from the parent uh, company group um, so if you have such a process, if you are belong to a group of, of uh, manufacturing entities, then your parent company group may have, may have made available this to you already. And then also you should um, upload process re recipes considering the usage of chemicals, all chemicals in inventory that they are checked against RSL compliance, letters of RSL conformance, sorry, and uh, so those are the elements that you need to upload here as well. So this is also quite a comprehensive question, but hopefully you have this uh, process in place already. And then the next question is the same question for MRSL. Does your facility have a documented process to systematically monitor, update and demonstrate compliance with MRSLs and segregate chemical formulations materials and product, uh, which products which are non-compliant with the MRSL. So those processes um, similarly, and this can be um, a prolongation so of your uh, purchasing procedure, um, because of course, to, to some extent, this uh, question will also be fulfilled by the, uh, by the purchasing procedure. And so you should have uploaded a chemical review policy and process flow Again, this can be from a parent company or group, and you should have a list of chemicals which do not have full documentation conforming uh, MRSL and a plan for obtaining appropriate documentation for the chemicals which currently do not have the correct documentation. So again, quite a comprehensive uh, procedure that you need to have in place here. And uh, we also would like to see as upload the MRSL is applicable to the facility. So again, if you have several buyers buying from you with different MRSLs, those should all be available. And you need to be able to explain uh, during the verification um, what, uh, which uh, belong to whom and how you are managing if you have several RSLs and several MRSLs uh, who you need to adhere to, how are you managing that? How are you making sure that you comply to all of them? Then also any positive lists you may have from chemical suppliers, email communication or communication trail, letter of compliance to MRSL, documented um, 
periodic screening process against CERTIHC gateway and also dated records of previous screenings and schedule for future screenings. So quite a lot, lo long list of documents that you, uh, that you may need to upload or will need to upload. So this was question number 12 and now we come to the last question in this section. Um, not in this section, sorry, at this level, at level one, can all of your production chemicals be traced from the manufacturing process back to chemical inventory? And this is a very challenging question. And I know I have had a lot of discussions during verifications about this question. Um, and what is needed here is the recipe cards with lot numbers, chemical inventory and the chemical mixing process log. And why do we need the lot numbers? Well, this question is here in order to make sure that whenever you have a failure, if you have a product that uh, has a higher content of a certain chemical above the limit, then you need to be able to go back to your process and check where does the, did this happen. And uh, you need in that case also to know the exact lot number. And that's why for every batch or for every uh, continuous process you have where you are using uh, dyes for example or other chemicals you need to know the lot numbers and you need to have them documented together with the recipe card uh, because and there is uh, no other way that you can make sure that you always know the exact lot number so many factories have suggested yes we can use first in first out uh, then we always know the sequence of the lot numbers that we have been using for a, for a certain chemical. Yes, you can do that, but then you will not know exactly when you changed over from one package to another or from a lot number to another lot number. And we need to know that. Uh, because, of course, in your final product or in your recipe, you will have the actual your, your product identification number or your uh, product order. And then uh, with that, you know, OK, I was dying this product um, uh, two weeks ago at 12 p.m. And then you need to be able to see exactly which chemicals you were using then at that day and that time. And it's only possible if you really know the lot numbers um, exactly. Uh, and so, and so, this is something we often discuss. But uh, we have also checked uh, with the Sumera about this. This is really a hard criteria. So please make sure that you can do this, uh, because of course, if you don't have that traceability. Um, here at level one, then you will not be able to move on to levels two and three. Okay, and I also have here um, one uh, one picture that shows um, this uh, traceability. So you have your recipe here, and this is in the case of the final product actually, but here is of course the process where you have then your recipe, your chemical formulation, and then you need to um, be able to have your lot number and link it back to your inventory. And of course, in the inventory, then you know your, your chemical supplier and you can go back to the chemical supplier whenever you have an issue and, um, and find out what the problem was. And then the next uh, question, and this is now, we are now at level two. This is question 14, improvement plan for chemical management. Does your facility have an implementation plan to improve your chemicals management program? And the suggested upload is, which questions were not fully achieved and why? And people responsible and a targeted date for achieving requirements for those questions which were not met. So actually, this is an interesting question because we are now at level two. And here we are asked to make an improvement plan for the questions at level one, where we didn't have a full yes. So obviously, if you have several no's at level one, you will not get this question at all. So you will not be asked to uh, complete this improvement plan. 
But let's say that you had a few partial yes, for example. If you have a partial yes at level one, you can still move on to levels two and three. And then uh, you should then um, develop your improvement plan. And even if you have yes everywhere, I'm sure that there are um, elements um, of the, your chemical management systems at the, as covered in the at level one that you can improve. So please use this opportunity to build your own improvement plan. Then the next question is question number 15. And now uh, we are beginning to go into the more advanced uh, questions. Does your facility have an implementation plan to reduce the use of hazardous chemicals beyond chemicals specified by regulations and or RSLs and MRSLs? So level one was everything about managing compliance, making sure that RSLs and MRSLs are fulfilled and um, that you also have a failure at capacity in place with the traceability. But here now we are talking about um, substituting hazardous chemicals even beyond what is already restricted. And uh, the suggested upload is a hazardous chemicals list with an action plan with assigned responsibilities and a time frame for action. If you have a good and comprehensive inventory list, then you will already know which chemicals am I still using that are harmful or hazardous and should be substituted. And then here it is your opportunity to build your action plan for that. And um, you should also uh, upload alternative chemicals trials that you may have been doing. And so, so this, this is basically at the core of the improvements that you have when it comes to the actual use of specific chemicals. And you may also already have um, brands or retailers who are buying from you who have been asking you uh, to work on such plans and substitute certain chemicals. Okay, and now we come to the uh, question number 16, preferred chemical sourcing. Does your facility source already approved or preferred chemicals from a positive list beyond chemicals specified by regulations and or RSLs, MRSLs? So now it is not only like with the question 15, where we are substituting a few chemicals um, uh, for better chemicals. Here we are really actively looking to source preferred chemicals from the different positive lists that are available. And in the How to HIG, there is a lot of guidance about which uh, such lists that um, are acceptable. Actually, this is a bit of a complex question to respond to because those lists are very diff different in nature. Some are true, um, true preferred, pos uh, true positive lists, and some are more of a sort of a screened against MRSLs list. But anyway, um, this is uh, what we have. The guidance in how to HIG is what you should be using in terms of what is acceptable and not acceptable. And here we also have one uh, scoring uh, uh, specialty. So for facilities that use chemicals in production, you can answer yes only if more than 50% of the chemical formulations in the chemical inventory are sourced from a positive list such as CETIAT CMRSL Level 3, Blue Sign, GOTS, Ecotex Cradle, to, uh, Ecotex, Cradle to Cradle Certified, and if it's ChemIQ screened, allowed chemicals. So those are uh, good examples, specific examples what, uh, of what is allowed. But you need to have more than 50% of the chemical formulations are sourced from a positive list, and not by volume, but by the number. So let's say you have on your chemical list, you have 100 different chemical formulations, then you need to source for 51 of those you need to source uh, from a positive list. And you can answer partial yes. If you have chemicals from a positive list that make up less than 50% of your inventory. So in this case, this is not specified. Uh, you need to have a few chemicals 
that you are sourcing from a positive list and then you will can, you can respond with a partial yes. And now there is also a 10% threshold for that is applied for facilities that do not use chemicals in production. So you see here, this 50% is relevant for facilities that use chemicals in production. Uh, but for chemicals that do not use chemicals in production, you can answer yes if more than 10% of the chemical formulations in the chemical inventory are sourced from a positive list. Actually, this might be quite challenging because those positive lists mostly actually contain um, production chemicals. So they may not contain uh, other chemicals beyond uh, what is used in production. So therefore, their selection might not be so significant as for, as for the chemicals that you are using in production. And here, of course, as well, uh, for example, you may be working for brands or retailers who are Blue Science System partners. Um, if you are doing that, those brands and retailers, they should be able to uh, make available to you the blue sign uh, positive list um, and uh, so that you can then uh, actually make sure that you can begin sourcing um, from this list. All right, so it's clear here, this is not about um, sourcing uh, uh, for chemicals or making sure that you comply to the RSLs and MRSLs. Those questions we already had at level one, here it is really about going beyond and using preferred chemistry. Okay, and the next uh, question is about the supplier collaboration. Does your facility collaborate with brands and or chemical suppliers to select chemicals for alternatives assessment? And uh, the upload that we suggest is the prioritize, prioritized list of alternatives for chemicals. The MRSL, RSL, substances of concern list, candidate list, the reach, um, substances of very high concern list, um, etc. The minutes from the collaborative um, meeting between the facility customers and chemical suppliers regarding alternatives. So um, this is, uh, if you are truly collaborating, this is about uh, working together with your buyers to select the chemicals um, that you would like to substitute and then let them go through an alternatives assessment. And um, so this is not about just applying a preferred chemical list. This is really about a true collaboration. Uh, perhaps you have had uh, previously, you have had brands and retailers who asked you to face out PFCs, for example. Perhaps then you have been working with tests and been testing different chemicals, etc., cetera, for, um, for that substitution. And of course, moving forward, there may be other examples as well. Uh, so it needs to be a collaborative project with your brands uh, uh, and retailers, or it can also be with your chemical suppliers on that side. All right, so the next question, question number 18, is uh, uh, does your facility contribute a chemical analysis against human and environmental hazard criteria? Uh, for example, persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic to this alternatives process. And you can answer yes if a hazardous chemicals assessment has been conducted and if facility is using the information to prioritize and have created an action plan with clear implementation towards safer alternatives. And um, this question is very, very demanding because basically you need to be a toxicologist in order to uh, conduct such a study. So uh, nobody would expect that uh, many of the facilities would have this competence in-house and be able to do this. Of course, you can um, let an, a third party do a study for you and that, that would be counted in that case. But apart from that, I consider this question to be a, a very, very advanced question where um, uh, it is maybe difficult for you to, uh, to comply to this question. And the next question may be a bit easier. This is the life cycle impact analysis. 
does your facility contribute an, ana an analysis of life cycle impacts to this alternatives process? And here we are talking about, for example, if you have done it via the blue expert assessment or blue sign, via LCA studies, but also via documented metrics for water energy waste, etc. There may be third party assessments and also something that has been added in the meantime, the material flow cost accounting, if you have been using that approach. And in essence, what we are talking about here is that you can, let's say you are testing two different dye stuff. And uh, the claim of the chemical supplier is that one dye stuff uses less water. Then um, if you can measure your water consumption for that particular process, then you can do, of course, a test with your current dye stuff and check how much water am I using here. And then you make a, a, a run with the alternative dye stuff and you measure how much water do I use here and then you can compare those two. So those would be allowed um, in my view here as documented metrics for your for your water in this case. So those are examples. So this question may be a bit easier but it still needs like a, an analysis from your side, a study from your side to do this. And now the question number 20 is nearly identical to question number 13. This is about traceability. Can your manufacturing process chemicals be traced from product lot number back to chemical lot number? And we uh, ask you here to upload product batch card, recipe cards, formulation sheets, process instructions, mixing logs and the chemical storage log. And this here, of course, this the only difference in this question is that we are tracing from the product lot number back to the chemical lot number. In question 13, we go from the process where you are adding chemicals back to the lot number. And here we take the final product, let's say at the outlet of the factory, and we and we trace back the entire way back to the chemical lot number in the inventory and therefore also the chemical lot number with the supplier. So actually in, in most cases for facilities who have already been able to respond yes to question 13, there is not a problem for you to uh, be able to respond yes to this question either. Then I have never seen a company that is not or a factory that responds yes to question 13 and is not able to respond yes to question number 20. Okay, and then the, and we are nearly there now. We only have three more questions. Um, this question, does your facility have a documented quality assurance program that includes performance of chemicals? The program should include the evaluation of the quality and performance efficacy of each chemical formulation used. Ensuring the process recipes of how each chemical formulation are to be used are strictly followed. Process controls are strictly followed and ongoing assessment of production quality with supporting records. So this uh, quality assurance program, this is also a bit of a broader uh, program. You may already have parts of it due, uh, due to your regular quality assurance program. And so you just need to make sure that you can build it out to conform also to those requirements here. Question 22. Do your contractors, subcontractors source already approved or preferred chemicals from a positives list to replace chemicals not already included in RSL, MRSL? So this is a far reaching question. If you have already yourself, if you are already sourcing chemicals, excuse me, from a positive list, then you can begin asking your subcontractors and your contractors or so your suppliers as well, um, to source their chemicals also from a positive list. And this is also one of the ideas with HIG-FEM to basically cascade the, uh, the approaches and the systems out uh, uh, upstreams in the supply chain. And what we need here is a description of your procedures, communication with your suppliers and subcontractors, 
and also a HIG verification report from suppliers and subcontractors. All right, this is the last question, and this is maybe a bit more demanding as, as well. Does your facility have documented business goals, processes and actions showing commitment? For example, equipment, process, choice of substitute chemicals to new sustainable chemistry innovation. And this may be uh, that you have a salt-free waterless dyeing, recovery reusing of chemicals, bleaching without chemicals, solvent-free processing, electrochemical dyeing process. There are many ways of doing this, but what is important with this question is that this is also a bit of a broader question where you should have several elements. So you should be able to show this is a program I have where I am making sure that chemicals management and sustainable chemistry innovation, so very far beyond compliance, is implemented in all my business processes. That I have management commitment to do this and that basically in everything I do, I consider how to innovate for a more sustainable chemistry. <clears throat> So this is as well a demanding question, but it is more of a programmatic, of a strategic question. So this is also very much up to what you, what you can do and what you would like to do. So it's up to your commitment to be able to respond to this question. And with that, um, I will not open up for questions yet. I will actually first go and uh, make a demo with you. So we are now in the chemical section <clears throat> and um, as usual we have a small introduction first and then, and I hope you can see my screen now with the HIC portal, um, uh, and then here are the applicability questions. So remember we talked about them, this is, it is important that you check that you respond correctly to all of those questions. Do you have dyeing or other wet processing? Do you have printing? Do you have laundry or washing? Do you have cementing or gluing? Fiber extrusion, slashing during weaving, leather tanning, lamination, extrusion, metal finishing, welding, and other production processes that require chemicals. So basically here, here are all processes that would be using chemicals. And therefore, the conclusion here is as well as an applicability, your facility uses chemicals in production processes. You will now answer all applic applicable questions. So this is just our testing module. We are here uh, just doing this for demonstration purposes, but we have chosen now to become a factory that uses chemicals in the production processes. And then the, the first question is the inventory question. And now, if I respond no here, and I should not, I hope that you really have an inventory with at least some information in there. Um, and then you see I get a follow-up question here. If uh, for data not included in your facility's chemical inventory, is there an action plan for obtaining this data? And um, so obviously I don't have an inventory at all in this case, but here then the question would be, can I begin uh, working on an inventory? But now we say yes here. And then we should check all types of chemicals included in the inventory. All chemicals used in manufacturing processes, chemicals used in tooling and equipment, chemicals used to operate and maintain the facility. And then I should upload the documentation. And then you see here, I should also add information about which information I have included in my chemi chemical inventory and that I have available. So again, this doesn't need to be in, in one single document, but you should have it readily available. And um, then there are also uh, additional here, additional um, information that we're asked about. And then the next question, does your facility make safety data sheets available to employees for all chemicals used? Are they posted? Are they available in languages worker understand? And I should upload documentation here as well. Does your facility train all employees who use chemicals on chemical hazards, risk proper handling, and what to do in the case of emergency or spill? And you can see here a long list of topics that I can include here. We have just marked up 
all of them. But this is a really good addition now that you can see you actually have to cover all those different areas. And therefore also when we look at your training documentation, we will be asking you uh, to show that you have covered those areas as well. Perhaps you have some that you haven't covered uh, and then uh, you should not mark them up. And then also the next question is then how many employees were trained? How frequently do you train your employees? And then you should upload the documentation. And then it goes on and on with the, the different questions then in the chemical section. And I think we can leave it here and, and go and see if you have any questions. And I know you have because I had seen that you had already started and asking a question at the very beginning. So, yes, what would be the appropriate answer for the question whether the chemicals are purchased based on MRSL requirements? Our facility does not use chemicals in production process and has only housekeeping chemicals. Kindly advise. In this case, I would say you need, of course, to check if there is any MRSL that are, is available for you and if any of the chemicals that you are using uh, is listed perhaps on that MRSL. And uh, you need to have the procedure as well because uh, there, the, even if the MRSL may not cover your uh, housekeeping chemicals right now, it may be doing so in the future. So you still need to have uh, the procedure. And then in this case, if you are then uh, compliant, then you can say, you can respond yes there. And you can, of course, and should explain also what you just did. And to say you don't have chemicals in production process, currently the MRSL is not covering the chemicals we have, and therefore we consider that we are compliant. Cotton yarn spinning will be termed as process that use chemicals. Um, yes, uh, it will, uh, but it is not listed. Uh, it is not listed. Let us go to the, let us go again to the, to the questions and check. Here we have dyeing, printing, cementing. It is not listed here. So, so it will not, that question will not be asked of you, but uh, I, I guess you will be using chemicals in that process. And in that case, certainly it will be counted as such as well. What about if we only use chemical for non-production, maintenance and cleaning in small quantity? how to get full point if we cannot find the lot number and sometimes the chemical we can't find the expire expiration date. Yes, for some chem chemicals the expiration date may not be applicable, so it not may, may not be available. But um, for non-production uh, you don't need to respond uh, to question number 13. So it, you should not receive question number 13 at all. We can go again and check. If we, um, if we select here, so we don't have dyeing, we don't have laundry, we don't have, uh, what else did we have? Nothing. Okay, so then you see here now it says your facility does not, does not use chemicals in production processes. And uh, let's scroll down to question number 13. So I have here, chemical, uh, sorry, question number nine about the storage. And that question you get even if you don't use chemicals in processes. And then you see there is no question number 13. So question number nine is the last question at level one that I get. And then the next question is question number 14 at level two. So I hope that that uh, responds to that question. Um, Will diesel, machine oil, refrigerants be added in the inventory? Um, refrigerants should be added. Um, machine oil, yes. A diesel would be ab added as an energy source. So either you have it in the energy source, in the energy section, or you have it in, then in the chemical inventory. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, there is a question about the recording and making available the documentation. Yes, you will receive um, 
the the PDF of this presentation and you will receive also the recording after this webinar. So all of you who have registered will receive that. In question four, practice drill refers to chemical spill drill. Yes. Yeah, and then we have this question. Um, for question 13 in level one, chemical traceability, is it okay if we just need to trace back based on information about the chemical name and quantity and not yet record chemical lot? Because in question 20, we have specific requirements about tracing chemical lot number of product lot. No, this is not okay. So at question 13, you also already have to have the lot number. So you do need to have the lot number in your recipes because otherwise you would also in question 20 not be able to have that traceability. So the question 13 and 20, they are very similar, but question 13, and they have the same requirements regarding traceability. In question 13, we are in the middle of the process. So in the actual, let's say, dyeing process, for example, or the washing process. And then we should be able to trace back to the chemical inventory and to the chemical supplier with the chemical lot number. In question 20, we are at the final product stage. So we have the final product. And from there, we should be able to trace back over the production processes and to the chemical inventory and the chemical uh, supplier, including with a lot number. All right. Can you please show us the best practices in chemical management in the dyeing and printing section? Well, this is, of course, a very far reaching question. I can uh, recommend to you to go to the SETI-HC website, uh, www.roadmap20.com. I will uh, write it down here. And, um, and, you, on that web page, you can find the chemical management system framework and the technical implementation guide. Those two documents uh, um, belong together and they are really very, very good document in terms of how to build a comprehensive chemical management system. So I recommend that you do that. The chemical management system framework of SETIHC and the technical implementation guide. Um, there are more questions, let me see. What do you mean with lot number? Yes, the chemical product lot number. So the lot number that the chemical supplier has indicated. Good question. Yes, what are the chemical formulation sheet and process instructions? Those are the instructions that you have in your own process on how to, for example, dye a garment. And it's, it depends very much on how, how your factory operates, but it basically includes then the different chemicals you are using, uh, how much of it and uh, how, how long, for example, uh, the process instruction, how much water. So it basically says exactly how you should operate your specific dyeing process. Will we include non-production chemicals when calculating a percentage of uh, compliant chemicals? I guess this refers to the question about sourcing from a preferred list. And then, um, no, you should have 50% of your, uh, of your uh, chemicals that are used in production. Yeah. We get too many requests from our customers that chemical suppliers also should fill in HIG. Is HIG also applicable for chemical suppliers? Yes, to a very large extent, but also not completely. But there is work going on to also adjust the applicabilities accordingly so that it is specifically uh, useful for chemical suppliers. But already now, chemical suppliers and uh, can, can use uh, the HIC. And it would be a good start, uh, I think, to already ask them to begin working with the HIC right now. 
There is one question here as, as well. We cannot find level two of chemical sections. Meanwhile, we have completed all questions in level one. I cannot respond specifically to your question, but there must be something at uh, level one. There must be some question somewhere that you haven't responded to completely. That um, um, that basically hinders you from moving on to level two and three. And if you are sure that you have responded to everything, then I think you should reach out to HICCO. There is a, a support uh, button on your portal that you can go to and ask uh, why this is not happening. But please go through all questions first and check that, the, that you really have responded to all questions. Um, Our chemical inventory list is commercially sensitive and confidential. Is it possible to have a non-disclosure agreement between our company and HIG? I don't think, uh, I don't know if they would do that, but also I wouldn't suggest that you upload any document to the HIG portal that is confidential. So it is fine if you if you say for confidentiality reason I am not uploading this or that document, but you should be um, able to show it to your verifier. If it is so sensitive that you also want to make sure that the verifier um, and the verifier is anyway bound to a code of conduct, we are not allowed to speak about uh, anything that we learn. Uh, specifically in during our verifications, but then you could actually uh, sign an agreement in, directly with the verifier instead. But I would really suggest you don't upload documents that are confidential to the HIC portal. And the reason is also that um, actually whenever you share your module, if you are sharing with, uh, with other suppliers or with brands and retailers, they actually also have access to everything that you have uploaded there. And therefore, for example, when you're uploaded documents, if you're, for example, um, working for several brands, uh, you may also be uh, considerate about what you're uploading there. Yes, should the chemical inventory list include the chemical samples, small bottles given by chemical suppliers for use as trial? Yes, they should. And you need to make sure that also the samples that you uh, have all the procedures in place and, and training for workers, etc. in place. Uh, why is having an operation procedure for an RSL problem not scored? The question 11. Yes, this has this question has been added in the HIG FEM 2020, and um, therefore that question is not scored. It's because the entire scoring structure would be uh, would be changed, and and um, very often, and there are some other cases also in the energy section, for example, where additional questions have been added in the HIG FEM, and they are not scored. Um, this time, they may be scored late in later years, but for now, it's just not scored. Ah, uh, yes. Can you please help to elaborate a bit on the question on less than or more than 50% blue sign certified? You also mentioned 10%. Yeah, let's go back to that question. Um, that is um, uh, that is question number 16 here. So uh, you should be able to see the question number 16 now. And uh, this is about sourcing already approved or preferred chemicals from a positive list. And the 50% um, relates to your use of chemicals in production. So uh, if you have chemicals in production, you need to have more than 50% of them being sourced from a positive list. If you have um, less than 50%, you can answer partial yes, and you will get half the potential total score. The 10% relates to a chem if you don't have chemicals in production, then you can answer yes here if more than 10% of your product uh, of your chemical uh, formulations are sourced from a positive list. So I hope that uh, answered that question.
you have two examples here. If we upload clean chain or BVE3 report, then it is okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the BV3 report I, I am not familiar with. And the clean chain is the SETI-HC. So um, that should be okay. Um, if it conforms, if it means that you have, le, le, that you have, uh, that you are at the MRSL level three, yes. In general, the information inside the MSDS is not always correct and not and does not cover all restricted substances as they unintentionally added by the formulator. How can we deal with this? This is a very difficult problem. I absolutely agree with you. And um, this may also cause failures um, with the RSL, for example. Um, and uh, so there is not so much you can do actually, um, apart from speaking to the chemical suppliers and uh, pushing them to give you more information. I know there is that is a weak point for sure. Yes, related to question 16, what is a positive list? Yes, you, you can see a few examples here. What SAC and Sumera consider a positive list? So those examples that are listed here um, are uh, seen as positive lists. And there is more information in the How to HIC uh, guideline as well. All right, so we have actually come to the end of the questions. I may have skipped one uh, that I didn't see really or couldn't read well. And in that case, uh, we will respond in writing to, uh, to uh, these questions. And in the meantime, I would like to skip through to, um, to a few last slides that we have. We have a few more minutes, so please bear with me here. I also want to uh, give you an overview of what our company does. Leadership and sustainability, we have been growing significantly last year and we will be growing this year as well. We are getting stronger in many areas and we are uh, hiring people as we speak. And so we work with brands and retailers, but also with large manufacturing groups to develop their materiality and risk assessments, and then also to help them develop their sustainability strategies. We work with a value chain approach. It is a very effective approach to understand where the different sustainability impact categories and aspects are located. And then there, from there, we can build a great materiality assessment and based on the results, build the sustainability strategy. We also work with business cases. We think this is really important that you can uh, create buy-in with your management um, for your sustainability strategy. We write sustainability reports as well. Then the second pillar here, we work also related to more sustainable materials. We help brands uh, create standards for more sustainable materials. We help them um, to develop their own product labels. And then the supply chain work you already know a lot about. Uh, we do HIG FEM, SLCP, at C, uh, we are also BEPI consultants. Um, in a few months from now, we will also be able to conduct cradle to cradle certifications. Uh, we write handbooks, HIG FEM handbooks, um, good manufacturing practices. We write chemicals management handbooks as well for brands and retailers and also for suppliers. And finally, we conduct workshops and trainings similar to this one, uh, one day trainings, two day trainings, face-to-face uh, -face or also virtual for to many different topics. And uh, here's our contact page. Please feel free to reach out to us uh, via our booking tool. This is where you can bo uh, book a certain appointment. If you are a very busy person, you only have a few slots available, you can go to this booking page and check when I am available as well to speak to. And otherwise you can also send us emails and you see here um, with a few different countries and regions, we have also people who are responsible there locally or regionally and can help you. So please feel free to reach out to us. And here are also the a whole number of webinars that we have been doing in this series and the links on where you can find the information. If you were not rest registered for the previous ones, for example, you can find the links on where to download the information.
And uh, here I would like to see, I think I have one more question. Uh, let me see. Yes, uh, does SETI at sea level one come under this positive list? So this is related, I guess, also to the question 16. Uh, no, it doesn't. So in the list you can see SETI at sea level three is seen as a positive um, list. So level one is not enough, is not good enough, so to say. All right, about our company, you see some very nice faces here. Um, we have more people on the team. And uh, specifically, I would like to thank uh, all our trainers and our team here in Germany who have helped develop this uh, webinar series. And there have been a lot of hands um, helping to pull those presentations together. And um, I think you have done a really, really good job. So thanks a lot for that support. And to all of you in the audience, thanks a lot for joining us for this webinar. Perhaps you joined previous webinars as well. It has been a pleasure to work with you. And uh, please feel free to reach out to us. There is a small survey, just a few questions immediately after you leave this webinar. If you could please uh, complete that survey for us, that would be really helpful to get feedback. What do you like about the webinar? What doesn't work that well for you? And what should we improve? And with that, I would like to leave you with please stay safe and healthy. Take care of yourself and uh, your families as well. And hopefully we will see each other soon again. Bye-bye.